touch of an artist's hand I see the world that you design Here in our I humbly stand Who compares to you? Oh Lord, I Lord How majestic is your name With the earth we rejoice While the angels sing your praise How majestic is your name
Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been And faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole, you show You're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes, for you will have your bride, free of all her guilt, and rid of all her shame, and known by her true name, and it's why I profound verse tucked away in the heart of first chronicles uh, that weighs on me as a pastor a uh, king david was a passionate leader and to give you a little bit of context it had become obvious to every soldier in israel he was a leader worth following that there was something different about this man because king saul 
uh, King Saul, God, because of the path that he had been going down, had removed his Holy Spirit from him. King Saul had begun to self-destruct. He was making horrendous decisions as a leader, and it had become obvious uh, to men who had fought for King Saul that things were not going to end well. And so soldier after soldier, commander after commander began to literally uh, defect and join King David's army. First Chronicles chapter 11 lists by name the skilled soldiers, the commanders that defected to David, men that were skilled at war, trained in military tactics, uh, men who were the fiercest of all fighters. They were in many ways the Delta Force, the literal, the Navy SEALs of their day, and they all rushed to King David to join his army. And when they joined forces, these skilled warriors, right, these commanders, thousands upon thousands of soldiers saw the commanders join King David, and they in droves came rushing towards his army. They followed suit so much so that when within a matter of days, uh, David's army went from a handful of mighty men to the greatest army on earth at that day. And I want to zone in though on a very specific segment from a specific tribe of the men that defected to the new king. First Chronicles 12, 32 describes a group of men that had become very valuable to King David this way. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, 200 chiefs, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, joined David's army. That is impactful to me. Because as a leader, a King David knew the importance of interpreting the times, right? You see, it's one thing to have military might and power. It's another thing to know when and how to use it and when and, and how not to use it, right? And so leaders need to be able to do just that. Leaders need to be able to interpret the times so they know exactly what to do. And so I think it would be wise with everything going on in the world around us right now in our culture that we would be able to stop and interpret the times so that we would know exactly what to do. And I think it would behoove us to ask God to hand over his Holy Spirit to us in this dialogue because we need to understand there's this refrain in scripture that weaves its way in and out of the Bible. Isaiah 55, 8 says it this way. God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And so as we ask God to interpret the times, we need to lean on his wisdom for that. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts I'll be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, unless you were hiding under a rock or you were maybe in a coma for the last few months or you were cryogenically frozen and you're just getting out, uh, you don't need me to tell you that the world around us, the world we're living in right now, is quite different than the one we were living in just a year ago. As a matter of fact, just think back to when the ball dropped in New York City to kick off 2020. We thought, man, this is the start of a new decade. We had no idea it meant the start of a new way of life for each and every one of us. Now, there are no shortage of people in the world around us who have attempted to interpret the times. And one of the ways people in the internet age have done so is they use memes, right, in order to, uh, to give their interpretation of what's going on in here. And so I want to share a few attempts of some people in the world to interpret the times we live in. And I think it's great to be able to share and laugh at these because when you face challenges, I think it's important to approach your challenges with a little bit of levity and humor as uh, we attempt to understand that the world, uh, the world that we're going in. But I found these memes, they made me laugh. So here you go. But there's a layer of truth, by the way, tucked into these memes. So here you go. I love this one. This is my first one. If 2020 were an infomercial, right? And by the way, hasn't it felt that way? Just when you find out, you know, this happens, you're like, wait, there's more. You know, there's another surge in this state. And just thing after thing has hit us time and time again. Wait, there's more, just like the infomercial. I love that. Here's one, if 2020 was a boat. There you go, if 2020 was a boat, right? And I don't know how many of you feel that way. Like, one of my expressions, look at the name of that boat, is no worries. People come to me all the time and say, hey, Jacques, I was wondering about this. It's not going to work out. I'm like, no worries. And a lot of us attempt to live our life that way, but with COVID-19 and everything that's transpired, our no worries boat might be sinking if 2020 was a car, right? How many people here feel like, man, your life is being held together by duct tape right now? Here's another one. If 2020 was a house, 
By the way, that picture says it all. No explanation needed. Here's one. If 2020 was a person, uh, you've seen these commercials, right? Mayhem, like me, the Allstate commercials. Are you in good hands? And I don't know about you, but man, uh, a lot of people are starting to wonder, are we in good hands right now? Thank God that we are in the hands of the Creator. Because on our own, we have no chance. Here's another meme of 2020 was a person. I don't know if you've seen the movie Misery, but back in the day, this gal right here with the sledgehammer, oh, she brought misery to the world. And for us, 2020, man, has brought in some ways nothing but misery, right? Here's one if 2020 was a mug. <laughs> If 2020 was a mug, good luck getting a sip out of your piping hot coffee that way, right? Like everything has just become more complicated for us. Here's one if 2020 was a slide, right? Starts off great and then goes, man, off of a cliff. A little bit dangerous to have your kids on this one. But here is one of my favorites. If 2020 was a slide. Yeah. Ow. Whoa, just the thought of that. And for a lot of us, 2020 has felt like that. But maybe you're a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory fan. Love that movie, right? You'll appreciate this interpretation of the times. At this point, I wouldn't be a little bit surprised, a leap bit surprised, if every month of 2020 ends in an Oompa Loompa song and dance, right? Like, Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Doo. Like, there's a lesson to learn at the end of all of these experiences we're having. Here's one for you, because I'm glad, by the way, my dating years are behind me. Some of you, you're in the middle of those years right now. I love this. Flirting in 2020, be like, blink if you want me, right? Yeah, it's been a trying time for relationships. Or here's this Star Wars interpretation of the times. I love this. I've almost completed my 90-day trial of 2020. Well, how do I cancel? How many of us have felt that way? Like, we wish there was a cancel button to everything that's gone on. And so, finally, one last meme. And a little prophecy in this interpretation of the times. Look at this. What if 2020 is just a trailer of 2021, right? And we're all saying, please don't let that be the case. Now, I hope you chuckled a little bit as we went through those, but let's let's get serious for a moment because 2020 has been a, a rough year in a lot of ways, right? I mean, think about it in more than one way, fear and pandemonium, starting with COVID-19, the coronavirus, in the wake of everything that's gone on, people are living deathly afraid. Like, what if it happens to me or, or my parents are older? What if it happens to them? And by now, uh, you and I have all known somebody that's come down with the virus or maybe even somebody that's passed away. But weighing on this culture is the imposing fear of death and dealing with that for people has left people stressed and depressed and they're hanging on by a thread, right? I remember very, very early on in this when you're you're hearing stories of, of this mom or dad or, or senior citizen that's dying in a hospital and their spouse wants to get into the hospital says, no, 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 you're not allowed in there. And they're having to say bye, like through technologies or behind glass. I remember having a conversation with Emily. I'm like, sweetheart, like, here's the deal. Please know that if, for, if, if, if you come down with COVID-19 coronavirus and you're in a hospital and you're dying and they're telling me I can't go in, sweetheart, I'm going in. I don't care if I have to carry a baseball bat, if I have to dress up in Dr. Strubs, I am getting in that room. And just think about the elderly for a moment. They've had it worse than anybody because they have by and large been on lockdown, like so their own family members a lot of the times won't want to go see them because they're scared to give them the virus. And a lot of our elderly people are like, I don't know if I have a month or, or a year or three years left to live. I don't want to live it in isolation. You think about the quarantines and the social distancing. And so many of us, we're just done. We want to see our friends. We want to see our family members. And I want you to think about how our culture has changed. Schools shut down. Our entertainment shut down. Our sports experience shut down, right? And finally, financially, things are falling apart. It seems miserable uh, for a lot of people as they're trying to figure out, yeah, I might be getting a stimulus check now, but when that goes away, what's going to happen to us? Do we lose our home? Do we lose our cars? Like, what is the future financially? Everything is unsure. These are the times we're living in that we're trying to interpret. I, and I, I was thinking about this the other day from the perspective of, of our kids, right? Because for us adults who've lived through some uh, severe moments of crisis in our country and the world, things stand out to us. I think back to 9-11, right? 9-11 is one of those moments for you and I 
where every single person who's a little bit older remembers exactly where they uh, were and what they were doing when they saw those planes hit uh, the World Trade Center and hit the Pentagon, right? We remember. And, and, and for us, like that, those moments stand out and they're highly emotional. But if we're honest, like 9-11 didn't really change our way of life. You know, it, it maybe at the airport it did, but other than that, it had an emotional impact. The coronavirus and everything that's gone on for our kids, it's like that with 9-11 for us, but on steroids, because it has completely altered everything about their lives. They're gonna remember this, and it's gonna affect them long term. So think about, as we're interpreting the times, everything that's gone on with this pandemic. And not only that, in the middle of this pandemic, we have, the vitriol of a political race, right? It's an election year. And div uh, divisiveness and animosity, if, if we're being honest, is at an all-time high. And a lot of the social media is like Twitter. Twitter has become just this cesspool of hate and judgment as arrows are constantly flying, right? So we have COVID-19 and we have the political race going on. And as if that wasn't enough, then we have the brutal death, the killing of George Floyd, right? And racial tension has bubbled over. There have been uh, protests and riots in the streets. We've seen them on the news. They're still going on now. Uh, properties being destroyed. Uh, Lisa and, and Leo Gosselin attended our church. They're wonderful people. Their son, Joe, I performed the wedding for him and his wife, Lydia, a number of years ago. He works, I think, in Richmond, a couple hours south of here for a hotel. They had just opened up post COVID-19 as the phases started to allow them to do that. Their hotel opened up and a riot took place in their town. Their hotel, the lobby, everything was destroyed and he was laid off. All of the hotel employees had, had, had to find another place to work because their hotel was destroyed in a riot. It's crazy, everything that's going on in the wake of the George, uh, George Floyd death. You have a Black Lives Matter campaign and, and every media member, every, every athlete, every actress, everybody's got a take and they're all putting their thoughts out there for you and I to see. And in the meantime, statues are coming down. People are driving pickup trucks. And if there's a Civil War statue and it was a member of the Confederate Army, man, a rope's going around that statue and it's coming down. Schools are changing their names. Street names are being changed all around us. And to top it all off, there has never, never been a mistrust nationwide of law enforcement like there is right now. The tension in our culture is at an all-time high, friends. These, these are the times we're living in. The world could sure use some chiefs of Isaac or to help us interpret the times so that we know exactly what to do. But the good news is this. God has put his spirit in his people and his word in our hands. Acts 2.17 says this, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your daughters and your, 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 old, your, daughter, your men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. In other words, this, he has given us his spirit and he has given us his word. And those are all the tools you and I need to interpret the times around us. And that's exactly what we're attempting to do today. Now I have spent time every day on my knees in recent months about this, in the Holy Bible about this. I have sought the advice of, of Christian men and women that I trust that are wise people because what I want to do this morning is exactly that. I want to help you interpret the times so that we can know what to do in the middle of everything going around. And so here we go this morning. If you're taking notes, this is where we start. Uh, three takeaways, three takeaways from these uh, turbulent times. And the first is this. And this, by the one, is the glue. This is the one that holds them all together. God is still in control. God is still in control. There's, <clears throat> there's a song I used to sing in Sunday school growing up. And it goes like this. And if you're sitting in your living room, kids, you can sing along with me. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. There's a verse that I love. It's the baby verse, right? He's got the little tiny baby. 
In his hands he's got the little tiny baby. In his hands he's got the little tiny baby. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. And I used to fantasize about the God who had something as magnificent and as big as the universe in his hands would also hold something as tiny as a newborn baby in his hands. But truthfully, as I think back to singing that in Sunday school, I mean, it was easy to sing that song as a kid because I had a great life. I had a family that loved me, a church that welcomed me. I had friends all over the place and food to eat and, and sports to play. My life was great. Singing that song is easy. When life is easy, can you still sing it when your world is falling apart? That's the question, right? By the way, I love how the book of Revelation opens up, right, in the Bible. And trust me when I say this, a God used the Apostle John to pen those words. And if there was anyone who understood turbulent times, it was John. Because John, by the way, at this point when he's writing, has been exiled. So literally he's been taken, he's been arrested and shipped off to the island of Patmos where he's going to spend the rest of his life alone, isolated, not near his friends, not near his family. And just before that had happened in his life, he had watched. He had watched the Emperor Domitian unleash a, a, a persecution across the church that had never been done in history. Like, it's never been that bad. People were ripped out of their homes. They were burnt at the stake. They were crucified. They were ripped apart by horses. John himself, in one of these persecutions, had been boiled in a cauldron of oil, rescued at the last minute, covered in boils and burns all over his body. Man, I think John would look at the things that are going on in the world around us, the turbulent times we're living in, and go, man, it's child play compared to what was going on in my day. And so when God speaks to John in the book of Revelation, right, speaks to him in the middle of the turmoil, the cultural tension, the upheaval, in the middle of his own personal pain and suffering, not unlike some of the things going on in our world right now, what God does is this. He opens up in the book of Revelation and he puts his hand on John's shoulder. And here's what he says to him, verse 18. He says, John, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to Hades. And the message is so clear, friends. As we interpret and we try to make sense of everything going on around us, God is still in control. He still holds the keys. He is alive. He is well. He is the first. He is the last. God is still in control. And maybe you need that reminder right now. A Jean Converse attends our church, plays keys for us. You saw her in the worship set that was done earlier in our Wednesday night Bible study, our connect groups a couple weeks ago. We do a time at the beginning of every Bible study for, for, for prayer and praise, right? And people are sharing things going on in their lives. And Jean had a prayer request. And you could tell when she began to share the request how, how heavy it was in her heart because Jean is a teacher. And so teachers are, are starting now to get their instructions as to what may happen when the school year resumes in the fall, and it's not looking pretty. And the stress in our schools for teachers is, is massive right now because they're basically having to prepare to do two jobs and will have to be ready to teach in school and have to be ready to teach students at home and probably be doing two full-time jobs. And they don't have a lot of say in the matter. So she's like, please, please, please pray for me and for the Gene Converses in the world. God is still in control is what you hold on to, right? When the lockdown hit <clears throat> and businesses started to shut down and close up shop and they're, they're going dark and people are being laid off. And listen, it wasn't long before my phone started to blow up from friends, people that go to our church, people outside of our church that were like, man, I lost my job. I've been furloughed. I've been laid off, right? And, and while the stimulus checks that came their way provided a momentary relief in a lot of ways for so many people in our culture because of what's still happening with the coronavirus. The stimulus checks are a band-aid for what could be a career-ending, career-threatening wound. And so to those of you listening whose your job is hanging in the balance, God is still in control, is what you hold on to. I, I stopped by a month ago to visit Gladys and Yvonne, right? I needed to see their faces. They needed to see mine. And I, I brought over some flowers and I walked in to pray with them. And when I walked in, you would have thought I brought them the world. Tears are rolling down their cheeks like, Pastor Zog, it's so good to see you. It's so good to see a human. You see, their family lives in the area. But because uh, Gladys and Yvonne are, are 
in the upper age category of people, like they are deemed high risk. And so even their family members aren't walking into that house. They're driving by on occasion, they're waving through windows, they're opening and having some conversation at a distance because they don't want to get them sick. And I understand that, but from their perspective, all they want is to be held. All they want is to have conversation and to share a meal with the people that they love. And this isolation has got them feeling lonely and the enemy is coming after them. But I watched and I listened to those two beautiful ladies. God is still in control is what they hold on to. And here is why. It is a priori paramount that in the middle of everything going on, you hold with a death grip to that truth that God is still in control. Here's why. Because the world around you is watching. You know, Salsa is in this monkey see, monkey do phase of her life that kids go through. And I absolutely love it because it's a great chance to mess with her. But on the flip side, there's a danger and you have to be careful because everything you say and do, she says and she does. So we have this nighttime routine where we race up the stairs on the way to her bedroom. She's highly competitive and does not like to lose. And so I don't know, it was like a few weeks ago, we're racing up the stairs. I grab her ankle and she's shoving me. And at one point, like she turns and she looks at me and I said, I'm coming for you and I'm going to squash you like the bug that you are, right? And I yell at her, I'm going to squash you like the bug. That you are. And she runs up the stairs. And she's like, ha ha ha, I beat you. Well, like the next day, She's outside playing. The neighborhood girls come over. Mila and Natalia are both Salsa's age. And so they're riding bikes. And one of the kids, Salsa had a thing of bubbles out there. One of the girls had picked up the bubbles and walked off. Salsa bikes over to her and says, uh, put them down, please. Or I'll squash you like the bug that you are, right? And so I'm like, ah, you can't do that, sweetheart. So I've got to be careful because everything I do, everything I say, she is watching, friends, please listen. The world is watching. And as you face these turbulent times, what will they see? Will they see faith or will they see fear? Will they be gone, drawn to the God that's still in control? Because you have an opportunity, Gateway Bible Church, like never before. Everyone around you is, is scrambling to find something solid to stand on to you. It's your chance to introduce them to the solid rock on Christ. The solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand and people all around us are doing just that. They're sinking in this sand. But you know the one who was and is and is to come. You know the one who holds the keys to death and the keys to life, friends. And no matter how badly things spin out of control, God is still in control, and that is the first takeaway as we interpret these times, that God is still in control. The second truth is this. God is still in control, but love, love is still the answer, and I want to share with you a few things that this book says about love, and I want you to keep those things in the back of your mind as we figure out as a church and as believers how to respond to everything in the wake of the George Floyd killing, right? And everything that's transpired in the culture since. So think about George Floyd and everything going on while you listen to these verses. First John 4, 7. Love one another. For love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. You see, love is the answer. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. Not some of the time, not when it's easy or convenient. At all times, love is the answer. Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up conflict. We're seeing all kinds of hatred in the world around us. But love covers over all wrongs. Love is the answer. Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4. Let love, let love and faithfulness never leave you. You bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win the favor and a good name in the sight of both God and men. Love is the answer. Colossians 3, 13. Over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Love, if you want unity, is the answer. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says this. Do everything, not some things, not the things you care about. Do everything in love. Love Love is the answer, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Love is the answer, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And if you're wondering how to respond to the black community around us as they are grieving the loss of 
of George Floyd and are grieving the injustices that they have suffered and felt for years, here is what you do. You love. Because love, my friends, is still the answer. You, you, don't, you don't respond in defensiveness, which I'm embarrassed to say I've seen so much of that, even from Christians. You think about the whole, you know, black lives matter. Like when we hear somebody say that, that is nothing for us to get offended at. But I hear it all the time. I hear people say, wait, wait, wait. No, I'm not saying that. No, no, no. All lives matter. I'm not saying black lives. And we throw that out there, friends. And guess what? You are right. All lives do matter. It's just not the time to say that. We're told in Scripture, and Pastor Hub brought this up at the interview a few weeks ago. We are told in Scripture to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. That is how you love the black community in the middle of this. You mourn with those who mourn. Because for Christ followers everywhere, that's, that's what Christ is calling us to do, to mourn with. Listen, let, let me illustrate it this way. If I go to a funeral, Right? Let's say I walk into a funeral and I look over in the corner and there's this lady, his mom, that, that's grieving and she's crying. And I walk over and I ask her, what's wrong? Why are you, why are you crying? And, and she says to me, well, it's, it's my child that died. And she says it to me, guess what? It's not time for me to say to that mom who lost her child, well, you know what? Kids all over the world are dying and all kids matter. It's not time for me to say that. It's time for me to come beside that mom and wrap my arms around her and love on her. Please understand this. When we as believers respond to someone saying black lives matter by saying, ah, oh, all lives matter, that's the same kind of message that we are sending. No, what we do is we love and we listen. By the way, I share this story with you. The morning of... George, George Floyd's memorial that was in Texas, it was a few weeks ago. I went for a run that morning, I probably ran about eight miles. And I made a decision when I left the house that as I ran that morning, and I knew it's weighing on the heart of all of our community and everybody around us, uh, that every person I ran by that morning, I was just gonna say that term, Black Lives Matter, as I ran by them. And that morning, there were a ton of people out on the pathways that I was running on, and a lot of them were a part of our black community. They're African-Americans, and every time was unbelievable. I want to tell you, every time I would run by an African-American couple or a group of people or a single person, every time I would, and I said, hey, Black Lives Matter, man, you should have seen it. Their eyes would light up and a smile would spread across their cheek and some of them said, thank you, thank you so much for saying that. And they weren't telling me, I saw in their eyes, they, were, they know that I don't understand everything that they go through in their culture and everything that they experience. But what they heard from me in me saying that was this, I know you care. And for us as a church, that's what, it's part of what we have to communicate right now is that we love and we're listening and we care, right? Now, please understand, by the way, this is an aside that I need you to pay attention to. Uh, for those of you who might be unaware of this, there is a Black Lives Matter uppercase and there's a Black Lives Matter lowercase, okay? In other words, there is a political movement, an actual organization called Black Lives Matter. And their principles and their values stand, what, much of what they propagate stand in direct contradiction to the things that the Bible holds as true, right? And if you were to go, up in that organization, by the way, if you're posting that organization stuff on your social media accounts, friends, it is wrong. You cannot do that. What I want you to do is this. Go take some time to go to the website of Black Lives Matter, uppercase, like Black Lives Matter, the organization, and you just... It's going to alarm you, I pray, beyond like just the kind of things that they are pushing. You can read it for themselves. We're going to put the website right now up on the screen that you can go and you can read what their core values are and uh, take a screenshot of that if you want and go to that website. Listen, we have to understand that, that that is not something we align ourselves with. But listen, on the flip side, how we respond to the cry of the community is this. We love we love. Do we condone the violence? No. The violence is wrong. The riots are wrong. The destruction is wrong. But let's interpret the times a little bit here. I love, I love, love, love what Pastor Hub shared about this in the interview when I interviewed him just a few weeks ago. He said this. He said, don't be overly judgmental at their actions until you fully understand their options. He said, don't be overly judgmental of their actions until you fully understand their options. In other words, and by the way, there's wisdom in that. I'm, I'm reading the book of Proverbs right now. 
And I came across this verse that captures that principle that he shared with us so perfectly, that truth, that how do you love someone that you disagree with what they're doing and what they're doing may even be wrong. How do you love that person? Here's how, Proverbs 6.30 says this, do not despise a thief. If he steals to satisfy his hunger when he's starving, is what he's doing wrong? Yes, but listen to what it says, do not despise a thief. If he steals to satisfy his hunger when he's starving, in other words, don't be overly judgmental about their actions until you fully understand their options. That's what the verse is saying. And then it says what? Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold even if it costs him his house. I love that. I love that. I love that. Listen, it it doesn't excuse the wrong action. Do you see that? In fact, the next verse describes how that thief will be accountable for that action when caught, but it also doesn't excuse the judgment and hate and pointing the finger either. That is not how we respond. We respond in love because love is still the answer. When you love, this is why it's so critical, when you love, the door for the gospel swings wide open because people want to know why you love and why you care. And so it opens the door for us to present the most critical truth. We're talking three takeaways in the times, the turbulent times that we're living, right? The door for the third one becomes wide open because here's the first one, God is still in control. The second, love is still the answer. And the third one is this, and this is so big. Our mission is still the same. Our mission is still the same. What is that mission? Matthew 28 says it this way, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's our mission, right? To share the hope of Jesus with people, to convict people of their sin and to share the message of Jesus so that they can turn from their life of sin and surrender to him and make them Lord. That's what we do. It's who we are. It's the very purpose of the church. It's why trusting God it's why God is in control is still is so important that we model that for people. It's why love is still the answer. It's why we love no matter what, because when we do, we have the opportunity to live into our purpose and our mission. And friends, that is to make disciples. And that has never changed. The mission is still the same. And by the way, in the context of our culture, and in the context of what we just unpacked a few minutes ago with the racial and social tension, you need to hear this because there are a number of churches that right now are getting slightly off course with this. Ending racism is not the mission of the church. Okay? The mission of the church is not to end racism. Now, don't mishear me. Racism is wrong. It is a sin. But this country's problem is not racism. This country's problem is not police brutality or prejudice or any of those problems. They are problems in our country, yes. But they are not our country's problem. Our country's problem is sin. And there is one cure for sin, and that is Jesus Christ, period, which brings up this. And Justin brought this potent and powerful analogy uh, to my mind and to Stephen's mind, a staff meeting a few weeks ago. And he was spot on because in a lot of ways with everything going on, the church, the church is on trial here. I mean, you've all seen protests, right? Going on across the country and they're still going on today. Maybe you've even attended one. And by the way, I'm not saying it's wrong to attend a protest. And Pastor Allen at a live church is, is a good friend of mine. And man, one of the first protests that took place in the Gainesville area, he and some of his friends took a giant cross and they just went to the protest and were the presence of Jesus at the protest. I know of other Christians that went there to just love and listen and encourage. Other church groups maybe brought water bottles. There's a pastor at a church in this area who went to one of the first rallies in this area, one of these first protests, and he brought his his pickup truck with some amplifiers and a speaker and a microphone, and he facilitated a conversation between the police officers that were there and the protesters that day. He had so much success in that conversation. He was invited to go to the next rally and to actually speak, and you know what he did? He spoke about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're all attending these protests. Listen, there's nothing wrong with attending a protest if you attend it for Jesus. But please hear me on this. What is an indictment on the church is this. We will march down the street in protest because of racial injustice, but we won't march across our neighbor's street to our neighbor's house to introduce people to Jesus Christ. That is 
Our problem is that we'll march down the street in a protest for racial justice, but we won't march across the street to present Jesus to a neighbor, friends. And until the church begins to understand and believers get on board with our mission, then all we are is a cool club to hang out in. Because if we're not living into our mission, what are we? We're this. We're pathetic, we're powerless, and we're even revolting to God. And according to Revelation, if that's us, he will in a little while snuff out our light. Listen, I, and think about this. I, I don't know how many times you have personally watched the George Floyd video. I've probably watched it a dozen or more times. And every single time I've watched it, I, I, I've cried and I've cringed. I've cried out to God in the middle of it because it's, it's just, it's horrendous, right? And to watch that officer offer Derek uh, show him with his knee on George Floyd's neck and he's crying out for help and saying, I can't breathe, man. It's just, it's so alarming. And if you watch that, I don't know about you, the first time I couldn't sleep at night because it's that chilling. And what's just as jolting, what's just as troublesome is to watch all of the other officers stand by, just watch. They're doing nothing. They watched and did nothing all the way till he sucked his last breath. They watched him until he died. They did nothing to save his life. And it jars me to think about that, right? But even more so, what jars me is this. It jars me to stop and realize that Christians in America are doing the same thing every day. It's not getting front news headlines. It's not being told. And we probably don't even feel guilty or bad about it. But in the same way that those officers stood by and did nothing. So many of us are just standing by and watching as friends and family members and neighbors, hand over fist, co-workers right now stand condemned in the eyes of God. The enemy's got his neck on their throats and if they die, they go to a place called hell and they're separated from God forever. Yet we stand by and we do nothing and we say nothing and so before we point fingers at the officers that were standing by that day like we all have, let me ask you this. Whose lack of action is worse? To me, it's not even close, right? Because standing by and watching George Floyd, like a life that was stolen, it's a tragedy, it's a travesty, it's awful, it's horrendous for sure. But facing your second death without knowing Jesus is the greatest tragedy of all. And so many of us have the souls of others on our hands because we are not saying anything, we're just standing by and watching. By the way, did you ever wonder why the Apostle Paul was so obsessed with sharing the gospel, because he was obsessed everywhere he went to everyone he met, he would share the message of Jesus. Why was he so obsessed? Here's why. Because he was one of those ones that stood by and watched. You know, when the church first popped up on the scene, he was not a fan of Jesus or Christians. He went to the Roman emperor. He got permission to persecute and pull Christians out of their homes and have them arrested. He stood by giving the thumbs up and watched as Christians were killed right in, his feet, right in front of his eyes. And he did nothing till he saw them take their last breath. He was guilty of that. And so when he came to know Jesus... He said, never again will the soul or the blood, never again will I just stand by and watch, not when I have something I can do. Friends, God has given us a mission, and that mission is what you and I have to do. We share the love of Jesus with everyone around us. Is that what you're doing? Are you taking that mission seriously, or are you content? It's not my job. You know, somebody else will do it. I'll just let... You know, I'll, I'll let the church handle that. Or you can stand by and watch as spiritually people are choking and they're running out of breath and we don't know when their life ends. Because if you are, and you look at those photos of the George Floyd killing, you might as well take your face and Photoshop it right there on the officers that just stood by watching because the same thing is going on in your life. You see, the world around us is changing faster than we can keep up with. But here is how we interpret the times. One, we understand God is still in control. He still holds the keys. And two, love is still the answer. Without love, we have nothing that we can use to combat what's going on in this world. And the third thing is this, our mission is still the same. So who do you need to talk to? Who in your life needs to know the message of Jesus. Don't let this day get by before finally speaking up and sending that text message and saying, my friend, you and I need to talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
I love you guys. Pastor Jacques, thanks so much for sharing that incredibly important message with us. And uh, Gateway family, if you would, um, let's just go before the Lord in prayer, um, asking him to solidify what we've heard today in our hearts. God, we thank you that your spirit still moves. Your spirit still brings conviction to our hearts. Your spirit still motivates us into action. God, our simple prayer is that we would not let our hearts be hardened even by what we've heard today. That our love would not grow cold for this world. But God, that you would spur us on to good deeds done in love for the glory of God. Help us to be a people that are known for our love who recognize, God, that you are in control of all things. And that even though 2,000 years separates us from when that first commission was given, our mission is still the same. So put our feet into action. Put our hands to the works that you've prepared for us, God. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, real quick, I want you to just hang around for a little bit. I've got a few announcement slides that we're going to be putting up um, on the screen. So just to make you aware of some of the stuff that's going on in the life of Gateway Bible Church right now. But have an awesome day. Hope you had a great 4th of July and just um, enjoy the day together. We love you guys. Bye.